There's no, there's no snow or rain, so uh, that's not an excuse. No excuses. We're all at home, <laughs> tasting and responsibly I, from home. And I, and I, and I know New Hampshire, so I know when the weather's nice, like you can go anywhere except right now. Right. <laughs> All right, everybody, we are live on Zoom and live streaming on Facebook. Welcome. Tonight, we are very excited to have Maria and Robert Sinski on for a little cooking demo and wine tasting. Before we get started, I just want to tell you a personal little antidote. Um, I love the Sinski wines. They were actually one of the first wines that I bought when I turned 21 at the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets. Um, so... I, I fought for this event tonight. You, you got, those of you who watch all of our live tastings, you know that we have a few people that help moderate tonight. I fought to be here tonight. So I'm thrilled to be here. Fangirling a little bit. Sorry, but very excited for tonight. Also on the line, we have Ryan from Perfecta. So Ryan helps make it possible for the Sinski Wines to be here in New Hampshire. And of course, we have Lisa Goslin, one of our wine marketing specialists. So welcome, everybody who's just joining us. Um, we're going to get started in just a minute. Maria has a great video to show us to kick things off. Make sure you stick around until the end. We are going to do a little bit of trivia. Maria and Robert sent a really cool package of prizes to Ryan and David over at Perfecta that we're going to be giving away to a lucky winner tonight. So, all right, Maria, I'm going to turn it over to you for our video. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Ann. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm an East Coast girl. My family uh, lives in the Portsmouth area. I actually have two brothers and my parents. So I am very familiar with New Hampshire. I love the state. Uh, and I can't wait till this whole uh, pandemic is over so I can come visit. So right now, you're just going to have to have me on video. And I wanted to start with a video, an overview of um, where we work, where we live, where we grow grapes. And this is some drone footage that my husband, Rob, shot a couple weeks ago. And this is essentially, this is a, a flyover in the Stag's Leap district. And you can see how high the mountains are. You can also see all this grass in between the trees. Those trees, a lot of those trees are dead uh, from the fires in 2017. So this is looking at the Silverado Trail. It's looking west across the valley. You can see how wide the valley is at this point. And then this is swinging around to head north. Um, that road you see is the Silverado Trail. And you'll see the vineyard coming up on the right. And this is the Stags Lake District. This is the winery. As you can see, it's tucked in this little amphitheater of vineyards. That's our Stags Lake uh, District Estate Vineyard. And you can see our photovoltaic. Wow, this is going really fast. <laughs> anyway, we'll get back to the winery, but this is the Kappa Vineyard. And we're coming on a roost. And on this roost, you see two osprey. Ospreys are birds of prey. And that's why we have these roosts to um, attract these birds of prey so that you, they can uh, control the gophers and any other critters in the vineyard. Um, this is a flyover of the Kappa Vineyard. This is where we live. Um, this is a little farm here. We have quail, we have gardens. Um, and this is, this is where, this is kind of ground zero for our life. And so you can see the slope of the vineyard. Everything we, we grow on slopes. We don't have anything really on the flats except for one vineyard in the Southern Carneros, but Pretty much all the vineyards are on slopes, which is really nice for the grapes. It's great for drainage. And then, yep, buzz, buzz over the house again. And we have our little greenhouse down there for um, right now I'm starting the starts. This is the Sintia Sonoma Vineyard. Uh, biodynamics is part of what we do in our vineyards. We're very um, strict farmers in biodynamics and organics. And these are the sheep that graze in the vineyard. So when, um, before the bud break happens, before the plants start growing, we have the sheep in the vineyard over the winter. And here they are running. These sheep are all pregnant. We just started lambing. Um, so we're having 28 lambs right now. This is heading out of our truffle orchard on the Cintia Sonoma Vineyard and heading through the vineyard. And this is where the, the Abraxas um, comes from, the Cintia Sonoma Vineyard. Um, it's a white blend made up of Riesling, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, and Gewürztraminer. Um, I'll be tasting and cooking for that tonight. Uh, very exciting wine. And here we're back at the vineyard. This is the caves. This is where we sell our, our wines. Um, it's tucked underneath the mountain in Stag's Leap. 
And so it's this warren of passages and this is where the wines are stored in different lots. So every stack of barrels represents a small parcel of the vineyard. So you can see where the break is. Some of the lots are very small, some of them are bigger. Um, so this is Pinot Noir and um, our Bordeaux varietals sleeping, the Merlot, the Cab Franc, the Cabernet Sauvignon. This is party town. Uh, this is where we party in the back. <laughs> it's also where we store our library wines, a lot of our library wines. And so you can see they're on either side in, in these um, uh, custom made um, forged iron racks that Rob helped design. This is heading out. This is kind of your uh, Wizard of Oz moment coming out of the caves and heading into the tasting room. And this is what we call our live fire hall, our great hall. And there, uh, to the right is a cooking fireplace, zooming through that back up to the winery. And you can see again, um, the photovoltaic array, we, we generate most of our electricity. We capture all of our water uh, in production. We don't use chemicals. So we recapture that water and we use it to uh, irrigate uh, our, our vegetable garden. So that's a little overview of the winery. Again, we're organic farmers. We, we make the wines in the vineyard. That's the most important place for us and another view overlooking the valley. And I think that I think that's the end, but you can see how so, steep that slope is. Someone asked, what is a library wine? What? Someone asked, what is a library wine? A library wine is a wine that's really old, one of our older wines that we keep and store in the library, the wine library. So those are our older vintages. Usually not, we don't show them to the public. Um, occasionally we'll release some, um, but yes, we keep them. We don't keep them for ourselves. We just keep them safe in our library, in our, in our wine storage area at the vineyard. So I'm going to now escape this and I'm going to stop. Okay, you guys have to bear with me, okay? Yes. You did great. Uh, Maria, we have somebody on the line tonight, Greg. And he is opening a bottle of 2014 RSV Pinot Noir that is autographed to taste along tonight. Wow, that's amazing. And 2014 is such a wonderful year. It was um, toward the end of the drought, so it's really concentrated. So it's a really beautiful wine. I think you're going to really enjoy it, especially if you have it with the teriyaki mushrooms. So I'm going to go over behind me and I'm going to start cooking right now. So, and we're going to switch camera. So bear with me. Remember to turn, turn off your audio. So you guys can you get a little glimpse of Rob now. There he is. Hey there. Now I've got to figure out how to turn around the camera. That's, that's Rob. That's Rob. Rob's filming himself today. And so <laughs> <laughs> I can't figure out how to flip the camera around on this. What do I do? All right, there. There it is. Okay. There we go. Okay, that's my side. That's my side view. That's fine. Okay, so mushrooms. This is going to be all about mushrooms. Everybody can hear me? Give me a nod. Yep. Everybody can hear? Great. So this is a teriyaki mushroom dish. And the reason I chose it is because I love mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms show up in the springtime. You'll find them in the forest. My head. You want to know my head? My head. <laughs> my head, my head, my face, the talking head. Um, he's in, now he's gonna he's gonna really irritate me now with the camera. That's my job. That. Anyway, um, so mushrooms, and I want to do this mushroom dish because it is it, it's a vegan dish, it's a vegetarian dish, but you can take the mushrooms and you can put them over roast chicken, you can put them over a grilled fish. So it's a very versatile dish, or if you want, you can just have them on their own. So the sky is the limit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the teriyaki sauce first because that's gonna take a few minutes to reduce. And so what I have is it's actually equal parts of mirin, which is a sweet cooking wine. Then, so that's a quarter cup of that, a quarter cup of shoyu or soy sauce. And these you can usually find at um, one of your local grocery stores or an Asian specialty market. And then we have um, sake, sake in cans. I, I know uh, the state stores have sake. And this is a guy, politically incorrect. Um, oh, actually, he is political. I thought he smoked a cigarette, but he wasn't. So canned sake, a quarter cup of that. And that goes in along with some sugar, which I want to get. 
Hold that thought. And two tablespoons of sugar. So this is going to reduce for about 10 minutes. That's why I want to get it going right now. And the nice thing about um, cooking with soy sauce is that there's a lot of umami in it. And there's a lot of umami and mushrooms. That's why it's a great combination. So this is going to go on low and simmer. In the meantime, we're going to talk mushrooms here next. So I have an array of mushrooms. Um, a lot of stores, they have, they, sometimes they carry fancy mushrooms. Sometimes they don't. But right now, what I can find on our market is my atakis. These are super meaty. Um, I have um, king trumpet mushrooms, which look like trumpets. Shiitakes. So shiitakes. Um, these are oyster mushrooms. Then we have, um, uh, these are little baby portobellos. They're also called cremini. And then white button mushrooms. Now, I don't want anybody to despair. If you can only find white button mushrooms, rejoice, because these are actually delicious mushrooms. And everybody always shames them like they're just this common thing, but they're actually great for absorbing flavor. So if you can only find white buttons or maybe only cremini, that's fine. You don't need these other fancy mushrooms. Um, it, it's not a problem. So what I like to do is, I always take off the ends of the mushroom. So you wanna trim the end of the mushroom. Shiitake stems are always tough. So that's a stem that you're always gonna cut off. And what I do is I save all the mushroom stems in a bowl. I don't like to throw anything out um, because it, I don't like to waste things. So I'll save these stems and when I make chicken stock, I'll put them in the chicken stock or I can make a mushroom stock with just like some onions and some wine and some water and make a really flavorful stock. So don't throw out these stems, they're really, they're really good. And then for the, the oyster mushrooms, you just cut off the very end. You want to cut off as minimal as possible because most of this is edible. These are the maitakis. I'm going to cut that off. Maitakis, if you have them, and I think you actually have some good mushroom purveyors in, in New Hampshire, but these you can just pull apart. Maitakis are really easy to deal with. Um, the king trumpets, of course, since they're kings, they're you know, a little more high maintenance. Um, these you have to cut and then slice thinly like this. And the idea is to get little nice bite-sized pieces and also not cut your finger when you're slicing them. So always know where your fingers are and never bury your fingers in anything when you're slicing. Shiitakes, you can cut in half this way. You can cut them into quarters to get a little bit of a different cut on them. Oyster mushrooms, just julienne. And then just slice these white buttons, just like that. So there is no right or wrong way for this. I know if you're, if you're one of those cooks that has to put everything in the food processor, God bless you. But if you do that, don't, just don't pulverize them into a puree, just, just rough, rough chomp them. Okay, so I, I cut these earlier and these are gonna go into a hot pan. Come over here, Rob. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, honey. <laughs> so, and I'm gonna put some, this is just expeller pressed. Uh, sunflower oil, and then I'm going to put a little bit of sesame oil in for flavor. And this is just a naturally pressed pure sesame oil. And then I'll add the mushroom. Maria, Sam, you want to be able like to hear when the mushroom should sizzle when you put them into the pan. And I know that two and a half, three pounds of mushrooms sounds like a lot of mushrooms, but mushrooms are mostly water. And so they, they cook down to barely anything. I know you guys have had that experience of having, thinking you're gonna have a lot, but ending up with just a little. Did so, I hear a question out there? Yes, Samuel would like to know if you can use dried mushrooms. Yes, yes. And dried mushrooms are actually great, but the thing with dried mushrooms, particularly with um, wild dried mushrooms, they sometimes have a lot of dirt. So what you do is you put them in a bowl, you pour over hot water and then you, you shake them and you lift them out. And what you'll see is the dirt will fall to the bottom. And you keep doing that until you no longer see dirt in the bottom. Otherwise, what you're gonna have is a mouthful of grit. And it's just because people just don't, dry, when they dry mushrooms, they don't, they don't wash them beforehand. So that's really important. But the great benefit to using a dried mushroom, all the water that you use, you can strain through like a coffee strainer 
and it makes a great mushroom stock. So that's kind of a little added bonus if you're using dried mushrooms. So yes, you can use dried mushrooms. They're slightly chewier, but but still still absolutely delicious. And a one a good cheat is to take white but button mushrooms and then take something a little more exotic like a porcini or a morel and, and kind of cheat and mix the two. And you'll have something actually really luxurious if you do that. So you wanna wilt these mushrooms. And if you notice, I'm not adding salt yet because the minute you add salt, this is gonna become what I call a pool of mushroom water. The salt will immediately pull out all the water and the mushrooms will start to steam. And you wanna cook these, these fast and furious. You wanna really caramelize the juices and, 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 and get them going. So I'm gonna keep stirring them. And you can, this is also a great, when you're cooking mushrooms, you know, you can keep them on high heat and listen for them and then go have a cocktail or a glass of wine or a sip of a braxis. Um, because, because they have so much water, you have a little bit of insulation from just what, standing over them and stirring them. And I'm gonna talk about the abraxas first. And the reason I told, chose this dish also is because it goes with all three wines. Um, the, the Asian elements of it, um, the ginger, the garlic, the green onions, um, the soy and the sweet teriyaki are fabulous with um, the blend of abraxas. Again, a blend of Riesling, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, and Gewurztraminer. It's this blend that makes the wine such a shapeshifter when you're, when you're eating foods with it because the foods tend to pull out the different characters of the different varietals. And so the blend is vineyard specific. It's seen Tia Sonoma 100% from that vineyard and the vineyard makes the wine. So we're, we're taking what we grow in that vineyard and we're using the different varietals to balance the acidity and the flavors in the blend. And it, it's a very unique wine um, to the US. Um, there are very few wines like that. And I have my, my as a chef, it really is, one of my favorite wines to drink with food. And aside from mushrooms, what Abraxas is killer with and the season we're coming up on is all things spring, like asparagus, artichokes, leeks. People are always saying that these, these vegetables don't go with wine, but you know what? They go with Abraxas. And I think once you taste Abraxas and once you, you uh, cook for Abraxas, you, you never go back. And um, another great thing, that you can um, have with Abraxas is hot dogs. I know um, it's a great hot dog wine, hot dogs with grainy mustard, hot dogs with sauerkraut. So when you're having that cookout, it's a great wine for that. But also New Hampshire lobster rolls. How incredible uh, is Abraxas with lobster rolls? Um, you know, the, the sweetness of that meat with the Riesling. And this is, Abraxas is a dry wine and there's no wood on it. But boy, that sweet succulent lobster meat on a lobster with a little mayonnaise is, is, is just amazing with Abraxas. So as you can tell, I'm really excited about Abraxas and very passionate about that wine. So these are starting to melt. See how much they cook down already? So only when they become soft like this and they look wet and they're really steamy, this is when I'm gonna add just a little bit of salt. So just a tiny bit of salt. And the reason I'm only adding a tiny bit of salt is because we're gonna be putting a teriyaki sauce on these. And the teriyaki salt sauce isn't salty, but it's going to add a little bit of salt. So we don't wanna over salt it because once you add salt, you can't take it away. And I, there's nothing worse than eating something that's painfully salty. So at this point, I'm going to add the ginger and garlic. I'm gonna add two teaspoons of that, ginger garlic and stuff. And in my little camera, I just wanted to show you a quick trick to peel ginger. Now, normally you don't peel it over. Um, let's go over to the cutting board here. Take a spoon. Ginger is usually super knobby. For some reason, I won the ginger jackpot and got one with no knobs. So this is less exciting to demonstrate. But what you can do with a spoon, just pull it down the ginger. So when you have all these knobs and these little nooks and crannies, just use a spoon. It takes the peel right off. It comes right off. See, nice and clean. No, no using a knife, cutting your finger, using a peeler, just a spoon. This is a trick that I learned from a food stylist. 
and I just think it is the best. So look at that, perfectly clean using a magical teaspoon. Okay. So back to the stove here. You can see it smells really, really good in here. No smell of vision. There ain't no smell of vision. So as, as this cooks, I'm going to fill my airtime talking about Pinot Noir. So when we were flying over our house in the Kappa Vineyard, that is one of our Pinot Noir vineyards. We have five Pinot Noir vineyards. And what's really interesting, even though we make the Los Carneros Pinot Noir, which is 100% Pinot Noir, and I say that because a lot of times Pinot Noir is not 100% Pinot Noir, that Pinot Noir is actually represents a blend of 36 separate wines. So when I say that, we have five Pinot Noir vineyards. Each vineyard is divided into small parcels based on what is special about the parcel. It could be what rootstock we chose, which is what goes in the ground, what, what, what clones we chose or, or, or heirloom or massal selections that we've chosen to pair with that rootstock to make the vines. These are, it could be the soil, it could be where it is on the, where it is on the slope where it's planted, is it sunny, is it cooler? All these different things make the parcels unique. And so what, what Jeff Art Bernig, our winemaker has done, he selected these parcels for their special unique features. And what we do is we pick it separately, we identify it separately and we mature, mature, mature it separately. So we went through the, through the caves and you saw those small stacks of barrels. Each one is one part of the vineyard. So what we do is we sit down, Rob, myself, Jeff Bernig, our assistant winemaker, and our, our GM, we sit down and we taste these 36 glasses of Pinot Noir. And each one is different. And each one is, is so representative of where it comes from. And not all 36 selections make it into the Los Carneros. Sometimes 28 do, sometimes partial lots make it into. It's not about making it all and then dumping it together. Like some places will just take everything, put, put it together and make a monolith that they call Pinot Noir. Ours is about nuances. Ours is about layering the flavors through blending. And that is why when you drink our Pinot Noir, it opens up in the glass. So from first sip to last, it's telling a story, which is, and a very beautiful story. I think our Pinot Noir is very elegant. Um, it shows new world sunshine. So we have the ripeness of the fruit, but not over ripeness. But we also have this um, beautiful acidity, elegance and balance that you find in a lot of um, Pinot Noirs from Burgundy. So we're kind of a mix between old world and new world. And that's why I love our Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir with mushrooms is a no brainer. Pinot Noir with sesame is brilliant. And I realized that when I sat down to eat a bowl of sesame noodles. So this was just noodles. Like I think they were udon noodles with a sesame dressing. And I reached for a glass of Pinot Noir and my mind was blown by the sesame and the Pinot Noir. So that's why when I do mushrooms, I like to include toasted sesame, sesame oil, it's kind of the bridge to the Pinot Noir. You could do mushrooms alone straight on a plate and it'd be fabulous with Pinot Noir. But this, this adding these, a little bit of ginger, a little bit of um, sesame and scallion is a nice bridge. So here we have the mushrooms that are getting, you can start, they're starting to get golden. And that's what you want. You want something that looks a little, little dry in the pan. Like the juices, Rob, can you show it to the juices? There's not a lot of juices anymore in the pan. Yeah, it's close to it yeah. Melt in the iPad. yeah, don't melt the iPad. So you are golden. This is where you're gonna stop. Okay, this is good. And to finish this, this is the this is the teriyaki sauce I started earlier. And when it gets a little foamy like that, that means it's ready. It can't reduce anymore. If you reduce it more than that, it's gonna taste burned. So we're just gonna drizzle it over the top. And we're going to toss the mushrooms in that. Oh, it smells really, really, really good. And you want to, I'm going to, I'm going to use my fingers to taste. Oh, wow. So good. If anybody's cooking a lot, taste those mushrooms. Wow. And you can add as much teriyaki sauce as you want. But the heat is off when I'm adding the teriyaki. 
So you get this beautiful cloud of like sesame and ginger and the earthy, earthiness of the mushrooms and that like, I don't know, it's almost like um that that soy sauce. It's like, I guess it's the smell of umami. And the way I'm gonna serve this today is I'm going to take some sushi rice. This is my vegan, my vegan version. And I made this rice earlier in my handy dandy rice cooker, which I could not live without. Actually, none of us in my family could live without it. A little bit of that. And I'm gonna plunk these mushrooms right on top. And that's another reason why you wanna keep them um, with the soy sauce, you wanna wet them with the um, teriyaki sauce, sorry, is you want those juices to go into the rice. And then I bring it over here. And a little bit of sesame seeds on top. And then some scallions. So really, really simple. I know, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, if you're a vegetarian or vegan, you can add some fried tofu to this or some cubed tofu. The sky, the sky is the limit for that. Or if you have a nice uh, roasted chicken breast, just plop it on the top or on the side. But very, very simple, very, very doable. You can do this uh, ahead of time um, and make it ahead and just oh, keep it in the pan. These sesame seeds are toasted. See those toasted sesame seeds? And you can actually buy toasted sesame seeds. They come and they, they say toasted sesame seeds. Um, or you can toast them yourself. And if you toast them yourself, it's easiest just to throw them in the oven on a sheet pan. It takes a while. You want to stir them about three, 350 degrees for about 12 to 15 minutes. And you get a nice toast on that. So that's, a, that's, um, that's that dish. Um, any questions about that? I mean, I don't have the, you have the chat. Don't you have the chat? On bruschetta? Ooh, bruschetta. Oh, oh, yeah. you know what? This is, it's, it's an Asian dish, but I think that it would be really nice um, on bruschetta. And I'm thinking now if actually, I might take the sticky rice that I made or the, the sushi rice and actually crisp it up into a little rice cake and serve it on top of that. I'm looking there. Mm -hmm. I'm looking there. I'm looking there. <laughs> I love this. I love this uh, Zoom Zoom situation here. But I want to talk about the last one. Do you have anything comments, Rob? Do you, can I turn the camera on you? Do you want to talk about Rob's being super shy today? Usually he's out in front, um, but he's this been is, building. This is the Maria he's show. actually been building a greenhouse so that I can do all the vegetable starts for uh, the gardens. Um, our, the gardens have really overtaken um, everything I'm doing now at the winery. I'm I'm, I'm in charge of the culinary program. But we're growing a lot of our own food because I really like people to come to the winery and visit and see, you know, what's in season, see what's out growing in the gardens and really get this connection to um, the rhythm of the seasons. Because it's really for our, our farming, for our biodynamic farming, the rhythm of the season is really, really important to us. And when we do things, we do things based on the cycles of the moon, which sounds like voodoo, but let's talk about the moon. The crazy things happen when there's a full moon, right? Insects like to hatch based on, I'm on there too. I'm on there too. I'm on both cameras and you're in that camera. Your back is in that camera. I know. He's, he's trying to block me. So anyway, um, a lot of things happen with the cycle of the moon. Tides are another thing. Um, we all know that the moon is very powerful. So it's not voodoo. There is some science, but no, we grow a lot of our own um, vegetables. Right now we have Swiss chard, kale, and arugula. Not, not too exciting, but we've actually managed to do a lot with that. Um, the fabas are going. The fabas are going. Yeah, we have, we have Fabas, but I don't want to talk too much about the garden because I know you guys are just starting to plant, so I don't want to make you jealous. <laughs> okay, because I know when I was at East Coaster, I I, I couldn't wait. So um, the What's little your point of view. My point of view is. So they're the pregnant sheep. These are the pregnant sheep. These are the sheep that we saw running, and I need to give you a little bit of inside scoop on those sheep that were running. If if Carrie Flores, our vineyard manager had seen Rob scaring the sheep and having them run. Those sheep were super pregnant and you shouldn't make them run. But anyway, it wasn't intentional. they didn't have their babies right away. So it wasn't intentional, um, but we do have 28 lambs right now. Lambs, I mean, lambs that some of them will save for the herd. Um, they're wool sheep. So we shear them and we use the wool. Um, the, the, the boys we harvest for meat and we also serve that at the winery. So. Um, and they also give us great photos like this photo on POV. Rob does all the photography for these labels. Rob actually does all the design. So we're, we, are, we also do all of our in-house design. Um, 
we're kind of control freaks. Um, but we also like the creativity of that. And we kind of like the full circle of doing everything ourselves. And we have such a great team. Um, we have a very small team, but um, we've all worked together for a really long time and um, we have a lot of fun. So, but POV point of view, POV is, people don't think um, it's, it's growing on the Carneros and the Carneros is actually an exceptional place to grow Bordeaux varietals like Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, what we have in our Northern Carnero, Carneros Vineyard called <laughs> Vandal Vineyard is um, a little toe of the Mayacamas Mountains. So it's the foothills of the Mayacamas. This is where we grow our Cabernet Franc and our Cabernet Sauvignon that goes into this blend. It's a very special vineyard. Cabernet Franc doesn't grow anywhere else. We tried growing it in the Stag's Leap. We tried growing it in our other Carneros vineyards. It, it's a very finicky grape. People talk about Pinot Noir as being finicky. Cabernet Franc is way more finicky than Pinot Noir, but it grows very well in our Vandal Vineyard. And so this is a blend of that Cabernet Franc, um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, all from our vineyards. We grow everything we make, everything is estate grown and everything is certified organically farmed, which is really, really important to us with biodynamic principles. We, we um, firmly believe in the health of the soil and the circle of life and taking care of nature. Um, by nature, um, farming is not a natural thing. So what we do is through our farm, we try to mimic nature. And so what we want are healthy, we want, we want birds of prey in the vineyard. We don't want to do any chemical fertilizers or, or chemical weed control. It's, it's very important to have a living soil in the vineyard. And POV, hands down, is probably one of the most special um, Merlot Cab blends in the Napa Valley. Um, and it drinks well above its weight class. I mean, this wine has shown against um, Cheval Blanc. I mean, I did a tasting. I went to the New Hampshire liquor store and I found a 2008 Cheval Blanc on sale. Yes, at the liquor store. I think it was Portsmouth Circle, I believe that store. And I bought it and it's like, this is the only time I'm ever gonna be able to afford Cheval Blanc. And I put it up against um, our, our 2008 Cabernet Franc and it was, it was pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing to see. Um, very, very different wines, but our our wine, our Cabernet Franc um, held its own, and that that cap, that's part of the Cabernet Franc that goes into this blend. Um, not a ton of wood on this wine. Usually, we're blending to about thirty five percent new French oak, which we do by having the different lots of the different grapes are in new wood and older wood. So when we blend it together. I'm looking over my, I'm looking over the camera, he's blocking me. You're blocking, I had that camera on back there. Mm -hmm, but everybody's I, looking at this one. Oh, they are? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at both of them. But anyway, um, what was I saying? Now I lost my fault. Go well, ahead. The, the, the oh, he's gonna northern, talk, he's gonna well, talk. The Northern Carneros is sort of, we, we think of it as the right bank of Napa. Clay. And it's a clay-based soil, a um, little bit of volcanic as you get north, but it has a, this, this ideal climate to, physiologically ripened Merlot and Cabernet Franc. So you lose the green herbaceousness, but you're not picking up a lot of sugar. So it's not getting overripe. It's not getting high alcohol. And, um, you know, when I say saint Emilion with a suntan, it, it has all the complexity. You think of the, the olive, the, um, the, the, the dried, the dried um, uh, herbs um, that you get in a, in, a, in a beautiful European wine, but it also has luscious fruit and, and phenomenal acidity. And this is, and this is natural city. You know, you know, Rob used to say acid comes in bags, but that was back in the what? The no, that 70s. was actually, I was on a panel with another winemaker. He said and acid he said, comes in bags uh, and not that illegal oh, acid. Right. But anyway, um, so this is 13.6 alcohol and, and, and this is achieved naturally through, through uh, careful management of the vineyards and growing. And it's really a feat to be able to have a wine that is, is fully ripened with still retaining beautiful acidity at 13.6% alcohol in the Napa Valley. So this is a wine, in case you haven't noticed, this is a wine we're really proud of. We love all of our wines. I wanna show you, this is the Los Carneros, which I started drinking earlier. So that's why the cork is out of it. Um, she I started at 9 a.m. Um, I, <laughs> I couldn't help myself, sorry. And then, um, and then Abraxas, this is Abraxas. This is this tall, Beautiful bottle, very elegant. We try and we try and um, design our, our wine labels so that people actually want them on their table. 
So um, trying very, very, very kind of quiet labels. Um, Except for oranges. I know, we're not gonna talk about that. Um, <laughs> but no, so something that, and we want the wine to speak, not the packaging. So I wanted to know if there's any questions. There are a few. Okay, well, let, let, let it, let it rip. We're ahead uh, of time. Going back to the mushrooms, Tracy would like to know if that was a cast iron pan you were using. No, actually, great question, um, Tracy. This was, a, it's a scan pan. So it's a cer ceramic pan from Denmark, but it's not, it's a heavy duty um, ceramic pan. So it looks like cast iron, it's really thick and it's a professional series. These, these pans are expensive, but they last forever. And because they're so thick, the bottom is really thick. You can use this pan on an induction range, gas or electric, um, but I do love, 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 love cast iron. And as a matter of fact, I have, my cast iron pan is right here. And I cook a lot in this pan. I do quick breads in, I, I bake in it. I, I sear meat in it. I, I'll do the mushrooms in it. I didn't do it today. I don't know why, um, but no, fabulous cast iron it is heavy but it is well worth it and very very affordable uh, my 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 daughter who's 21 she was like needed a pan you know she's talking about all these fancy pans and i said you know ella all you need is a cast iron pan and she's like oh they're so heavy um and i'm like it doesn't matter you will take that pan with you um the, you know you'll have it for the rest of your life and you live in brooklyn not a good area you can use it as a weapon so where does the name of practice come from Okay, uh, you know, Rob's gonna answer this question. You <laughs> answer the question about Braxis because Rob okay. actually named Abraxas. Abraxas I, I had nothing is, to do with is this. The, um, the Egyptian Gnostic god of the 365 heavens. So Abraxas oversaw every day of the year. And also Abraxas was the Jungian concept of good and evil. And that we all have good and evil, but many of us delude ourselves with a fantasy. And it's only by embracing the good with the bad that we can define character. But also, I need to add, um, there's a book called Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse, and in that book was the, the character, the, the character was named Abraxas, and he was kind of the benevolent character looking for good, correct? And I thought it was really interesting how Carlos Santana must have read Steppenwolf, of which there was a band, band called Steppenwolf. But also but Black Magic Woman. That's where Black it, Magic Woman. That's, exactly. where, that's where it came from. From Abracadabra. Yeah. Black magic woman. Abraxas became abracadabra, so it became magic. So you know, so when you think about it, when, when we name when we name wines, we go we go really. Speaking of, what we did, go really where, did, where did POV come from? Point of view. Mm -hmm. but oh, but tell oh, the whole story. Right? Okay, you know. wait, the bad, the porn story? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, should I tell that story? Is it okay? I have time. Hey, we're we're X-rated here. Go ahead. Okay, so it's not really a bad porn. It's like not bad porn story, but the thing is, we had first made we first blended the POV in two thousand five, and I think it was two thousand seven. And this was before you know I was I guess we had cell phones, right? We had cell phones, but we didn't have phones. I couldn't once I got on the plane, I couldn't call you. We weren't masters of Google. Yeah, we weren't masters of the universe yet. So anyway, so I'm with another vintner, and the vintner says to me. You know, I hear you have a wine coming out called POV. Um, you know, we were going to make a wine called POV, but we didn't. And I was like, oh, really? Why? It's such a great name. He goes, well, you know, I Googled it and I came up with POV porn. And I said, what? I never heard of that. I mean, POV, that's point of view photography. I, I, you must be mistaken. And so I, I called Rob and he didn't pick up, of course. So I had to get on the plane spent three i think four hours from chicago to to san francisco wondering if we were going to lose our business because we had named a wine after uh, a really bad thing that we shouldn't have had or even suggested i show up i go rob rob so and so said that they didn't name it because of pov porn you know and when i googled it i just got pov photography i didn't get porn i don't know what's going on he goes well google it now like google it and i googled it and i got pov photography and 13 pages later, I'm still looking and I see POV porn. And I'm like, what is up with that? And Rob's like, first of all, Maria, people know about that. And I'm like, well, I didn't know about it. And my Google search didn't know about it. So I didn't know about it. Okay, but what's the real reason behind POV? Well, the point of view is the photography. And you're... And, go ahead, keep going, keep going. And the fact that 
every year, since we grow everything we make, we only have a certain amount of each grape. We don't bring in outside fruit. So we can't do kind of a paint by number blend where you're doing 30% of this, 30% of that, and 40% of something else. We have to take what we've grown and blend it to what is the best interpretation of the vineyard, of the vintage. And that's why we get this vineyard, the vintage character in this wine because the blend shifts between those three grapes um, every, every vintage. And so we like to say that it's our point of view on the vintage. So this is a very, um, this is pretty atypical of Napa wines where people are making the same blend over and over again, no matter what. And, and because we, we, we're not buying grapes, we have to make something that is very crafted and very much of that vintage, well, we very expressive. You should, you should approach winemaking with a point of view. So he's gonna tell you anyway. Otherwise you're chasing the market. But what I was trying to get at is giving Maria credit for creating this wine because um, she kept trying to convince me to use the photographs and, oh, and all, this and guy, all that Oh, this guy has like literally every, every year he takes like 20,000 photos and he's asking me to frame his photos and hang them on the wall. And I said, you think I have time to go to a framing shop and, and, and do this? I don't have time, put, them on a, put it on a bottle of wine. No, I'm not gonna put it on a bottle of wine. That, that's really egotistical, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, Rob, they're really beautiful photos. You should really put it on a bottle of wine. And I would just kind of mock up bottles of wine with some of his photos until he finally gave in. And so- He was supposed to work for one year. We were supposed to test it for one year. It was our. Did we test it for one year? Well, we it didn't became test our it. fastest selling wine, so it was sort of like became part of the process from, from then on out. Well, the thing is, is but, that every year we choose three new labels, so there's three new photographs. Um, so a triptych every vintage. Triptych every vintage. Three, mm -hmm. but the, and we kind of decide everybody votes on them. So we send it around the winery, and all all the our employees kind of give their comments on which ones they like. And so it's kind of a group effort um, to bring the photographs to the bottle of wine. But I think my idea was actually to have three photographs and three different blends and pack three different blends into one case. Thank and, God we didn't go and down no, that. And Jeff Burning, our winemaker, literally looked at me with the, the straightest face with like death in his eyes and said, if you do that, I will quit. And so we didn't do that. So it's just one blend. But it, it does. So if you're tasting the POV side by side, you'll see that there, it's, Every vintage, it's slightly different, but it feels the same. It's this kind of, it's a continuation, vintage after vintage, which is really cool when you get a chance to uh, taste the vertical of POV. And I know that um, New Hampshire is a great supporter of our wines, and um, we have so many amazing customers. And I know that people do save the POV and do these vertical tastings. Ask if you're planning on coming and doing a demonstration in New Hampshire. You're darn tootin' I am, as soon as the, you know, as soon as I get vaccinated and we're okay to fly and, you know, literally when they said stay home a year ago, Rob and I have stayed home. We haven't gone anywhere. I look at my friend skiing and I'm like, how do we go skiing? He goes, uh, there's a pandemic. We're supposed to stay at home. <laughs> so we have, we've really towed the line and we stayed home and it's been a blessing and a curse. I've never had so much time to garden and take care of things that I never had a chance to take care of. So in a way, it was nice just to stay put, um, especially in the light of so much suffering and pain. So I am eternally grateful for this year and this time. And um, I know we're gonna get through this and I hope everybody, we're almost at the finish line and we gotta stick together on this, right? What grapes are in the POV? POV is, Cab Franc, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. That and that's a sh again a shift of the the blend every year. And when we when we when we blend this, we actually don't look at percentages. We're doing it by aromas, flavors, texture. How does it feel in our mouth when we swallow? How does it feel when it goes down your throat? I mean, is it lingering? One thing you'll notice, especially if you're drinking our wines right now, swallow the wine and notice that how much it lingers in your mouth. It, your mouth salivates, it, it, it stays with you for a little bit. And in, in wines that aren't meant for, to, for, the, for the marathon, that, that finish will be pretty short. It'll be short and cheerful and, 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 and cheap and cheerful, I call it. And you're gonna suck that down within like six to eight months and you're good. But our wines, we wanna go, um, we're in for the long, long haul. So is that another question? 
just a lot of thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wait, people can't leave yet because we have the giveaway. Mm -hmm. So uh, Greg, who is drinking along with the 2014 vintage, he actually is the person who wants you to come do a cooking demo. So. Well, I think I think I did. OK, I did miss one question. Um, is this a good do early dish? And how would you reheat it if you do it ahead of time? So what I would do is I would make this head. I would not add, uh, of course, you're not going to add the sesame or the scallions yet. You're going to save that to garnish. But you can saute this, add the, add the teriyaki. Then you can refrigerate it, cool it down, refrigerate it overnight or for a couple of days. It's fine. Um, and then just reheat it gently. A little touch more oil in the pan and then reheat it gently with a lid. Toss, 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 and you, it should be fine. Now, if you add the teriyaki um, and then you chill it down, you don't want to throw it on, on high heat because you'll burn the teriyaki sauce. So I guess what you could do is you could cook the mushrooms down, don't add the teriyaki, throw the mushrooms into the refrigerator, next day, next two days, bring the mushrooms out, saute them, then add the teriyaki and finish it. The teriyaki will keep forever. Um, you, you can also freeze the teriyaki and sauce. And then the question was, um, how, how do you know the teriyaki sauce is sufficiently reduced? Um, you taste it. it. It's not going to be thick like a thickened sauce. It's going to be slightly viscous. It, on low, on, on medium low heat, it takes about ten to fifteen minutes. It's it's a it's a thinner thinner style teriyaki. And this this is this is the money teriyaki sauce. So it's meant to if you're grilling something, it's meant to finish things. So you grill chicken and then you brush it on as you took it off. Because, I mean, you could put it on and caramelize it, but it'll get a little bitter, but it's a finishing teriyaki sauce. And you can use it for any cut of fish, meat, poultry. Um, it really is delicious. And so keep it in your bag of tricks. Which wine is best with salad? Oh, Abraxas. Oh, that was someone, must know, someone must know me or know Abraxas and salads, but okay. Abraxas, if you, if you use Abraxas with a, with a fruit element, or a pear, like a roasted pear, or blue cheese, or nuts. It is like it's roll your eyes back good um, in, with a salad. Roasted, I do a butternut squash, a roasted butternut squash with chicories and a sprinkling, a crumble of blue cheese and toasted pecans on top, and it is it is amazing, absolutely amazing. And are you going to be supplying a copy of the recipe? Yes, yeah. the copy, the recipe is available from Carolyn. <laughs> yes. So, Paul. Uh, we did email that out, and if you did not receive that, uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat, and I can send you a PDF copy. I know a couple of people mentioned that it went to their junk folder because it came from the email came from Eventbrite, so I will shoot my email address into that chat. Anybody needs anything? You need a copy of your coupon, a copy of the recipe. I'm your girl. And things are, I know, things are starting to open up here in California, and so we the winery was closed for much of last year between. Um, the pandemic and the fires. Um, we had fires and we were supposed to host people outside, but we couldn't because it was too hot and too smoky. Um, but um, it's really beautiful out right now. And as soon as you guys are ready, please come visit. As soon as the world is ready, please come out and, and visit us. And I will come to New Hampshire and visit you guys and visit my family, which I haven't seen for a year. So I'm, I'm very excited for that. So any other questions? Are we going to do the giveaway? Yes. So, well, before we do the giveaway, um, I do have a question from Facebook for Lisa. So Lisa, somebody on Facebook is wondering if all of the Sinsky wines are readily available in our stores or are they only available at select locations? So, yes, um, they are readily available. Um, there are, so the Abraxas and the POV are limited inventory, but if you have a home store um, that doesn't carry it, we can arrange for the product to be transferred to the store of your choice. Um, but all three of these wines are available in New Hampshire. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. And more. <laughs> and more. No. Yes, we do have a few more. <laughs> yeah. No, New Hampshire is very, very good to me. <laughs> very, very good to us. But no. All right. Are you all ready for a giveaway? So... Maria and Rob have very generously sent a prize pack to the team at Perfecta. So Ryan is on the line tonight and we know David from Perfecta as well. So they will be helping coordinate prize fulfillment for whoever wins tonight. And you are going to get jams from the vineyard, almonds from the vineyard, uh, crackers that were house made, 
a Robert Sinsky Winery Corkscrew and a cookbook. So this is uh, a fabulous prize pack that everybody who is watching tonight is eligible for. All you have to do is answer a question, a question correctly. And everybody who answers correctly, I'm gonna put into a randomizer and pull one of the names to win the prize pack. Sounds like a blender. <laughs> it is. It's an online blender of names. So, all right, Maria, do you wanna ask the question and I'll watch for the answers? Sure. Oh God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, what are the four grapes that make up the blend of Abraxas? I know, I wish we had some Jeopardy music. I know. Now I would like to mention for those of you watching, Maria mentioned these grapes multiple times. We've been planning this trivia question. <laughs> she planted that seed within I know you guys. <laughs> And they're supposed to respond in the chat, right? Yes, in the chat and on Facebook. Oh, dual, dual. Yep, I'm watching. I'm checking Facebook on my phone. They're asking to repeat the question. Okay, the question is, what four grapes make up the, gra the, the blend in Abraxas? What four grapes? So I need the names of the four grapes that make up the blend for Abraxas. And they're white grapes. There we go. Uh, while we while we, while those answers come in, Jill on Facebook wants you to know that the sauce is perfect. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> it is, a, you know, and actually, I to to I have to credit um, the woman who has the blog one, just one cookbook. It is a Japanese blog. Um, her recipes are amazing, and that's where this recipe is from. So the mushroom recipe is mine the teriyaki and I should have put that on the actually on these this on this recipe so if you guys want to make a note of it just remember just one cookbook it's going Excellent. to be tough to choose a winner you got a few coming in I know I'm gonna I'll randomize oh, them are they posting? Are they putting in the I would like to give credit to everybody who is spelling um I'm gonna say it wrong now Gert Gertzwaminer correctly Gertzwaminer <laughs> Gewürztraminer. There are quite a few correct spellings of it, including the dots over the E's, which oh, I, uh, uh, the umlauts. I should know that. So I'm very proud of all of you for your that correct spellings. That is impressive. Because I, I even screw it up from time to time. And I'm actually from Alsace, where the, where they grow a lot of Gewürztraminer, so. <laughs> Oh, a few close ones. All right, everyone. I'm going to give you another couple of seconds to potentially give the right answer. And then I will be asking Maria a last couple of questions. And while she answers those, I will pull from the randomizer. randomizer. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that everybody has enjoyed the demo tonight. I hope you were drinking along, having a great Thursday night. It is Thursday, right? Um, oh, the God. The weather in New Hampshire has been great this week. So I hope some of you are even out on your decks or in your screen porches enjoying the nice weather. Oh, I miss that. I miss, 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 miss the East Coast. Really, really. As my husband says, you can take the girl out of New York, but you can't take New York out of the girl. I was raised in New York, upstate New York, but um, roots all over New England. So I really, really miss it. All right, everybody, I'm, I'm gonna pull the winner. But while I do that, Maria, we have a, a, a multiple part question for you. Uh oh. Okay. Have you ever attended Wine Week here in New Hampshire? And if you have, what was your favorite part of it? Yes, I've been to Wine Week like every year for I don't know how how many years. Um, and people would be like, "You're going to New Hampshire in January?" And I'd be like, "Oh man, I'm from the East Coast. I love snow, darkness. I don't care. Cold." It's awesome. Um, but what I like about Wine Week the most is, is seeing, meeting people, meeting people that are passionate about wine, um, meeting people that sell our wine, but also people that drink our wine. Um, and the fact that there are so many wines available to the consumer. So, you know, with the, the, with the gala that benefits Easter seals, when people come into that, I mean, there, there are so many wines to taste. And so I get exposed to 
a lot of consumers that wouldn't necessarily be seeking out my wine, but they stop by the table. I learn about what they're about, what they like. They learn about my wines. Um, and it's just a very, it's a very exciting week. And it, it's, it's such a fast week. We get to do dinners. We, we do in-store tastings. Um, and so it, it feels like it's going to be well, five long days. And before I know it, it's like, it's like, it's over. It feels like it was two hours. So that is, that is probably hands down the most, um, well thought out event that I go to around the country over multiple days. Your sorority sisters say hi. Oh, hi girls. <laughs> How great is that? <laughs> so, but no, no. The winter wine week, winter wine spectacular, amazing and so well done. So well done. Um, and I can't wait till we're back in the saddle and in person again next year. You know, that I'm really looking forward to that. Us too. Yeah. All right. Well, I have our winner and it is Greg. So, Greg, I'm going to put my email Greg. in the chat and just email me and we will coordinate your prize. Awesome. Thank you to so, everybody oh, who tuned and, in. And what was the winning answer? Oh, yes, the, the winning yes. answer. So the winning, well, the four wines, four, excuse me, four grape types that make up the wine are Riesling, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, and the one that I have already said wrong Gewürz. a couple of times. Gewürz, Gewürz. Gewürz. <laughs> it's like teasing. Gewürz <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. This was Thank so you. fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Maria, you, Rob. Thank you for joining us. It was so great to have you guys on tonight. We can't wait to see you in real life. And so for those of you tuning in tonight, um, tonight was part of our series in honor of Women's History Month. So Maria, thank you for being an amazing women, woman in wine. We love you. We love your wines. You're amazing. Having me. We have a couple more events coming up next week in honor of Women's History Month. So check out our Facebook or our Eventbrite page or our blog, uh, explore.liquorandwineoutlets.com. You'll find all of our upcoming events. We've got some fun things planned for April too. So hope you guys like hanging out with me and Lisa because you'll be seeing some more of us in the coming weeks. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you so much for um, doing this and we want Rob to come to Winter Wine Spectacular. I'm, I'm totally getting him to come. I'm totally getting him to come. Oh man! No, I want him to come. But... 21. You have to, yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be really fun. And then you know, my family. We see my family, so it's like it's killing two birds with one stone. You know. So I see. Uh, for for my final line on tonight, I say, "Drink less, drink better." That's okay? a great way. Look, Okay. Or drink more and drink better. Or drink more and drink better. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. Just drink better. <laughs> Just drink better. <laughs> and hope, thank you all for attending and, and checking us out. This is really uncensored here. So don't hold anything that I said against me. Um, and you all, it's good seeing your faces again. And um, we'll see you soon. Awesome. We'll see you soon. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>